Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out here. Um, so, yeah, I know my talk's technically titled Onyx Meets Flank, but uh, in the process of the last few months, uh, uh, I've discovered that it's actually, in many cases, easier to incorporate PyTorch and other libraries directly. We'll still talk about Onyx at the beginning, but then I'll move in to just kind of incorporating PyTorch and uh, directly into Flink. Um, okay. Okay, so overview. So um, we're going to just start with kind of the, the problem and the kind of motivation. And as I said before, just move on to Onyx, kind of the overview and some of it, its current limitations. And then I'm just going to look at kind of an end-to-end -end example with uh, Java Embedded Python or JEP. Um, yeah, I'll be referring to it as JEP for a lot, and that just stands for Java Embedded Python. Um, okay. So goals, so one of the things that like I, I focus in and I want to do is make it easier to move models from kind of research environments, you know, like major ML conferences and papers into production and actually utilize those models effectively. Um, and currently that's still very hard to do for a variety of reasons. Some of it's messy code to begin with, some of it's that we have all these frameworks that are essentially written in Java and Scala, yet the majority of all these papers and code is all implemented in Python. Um, so yeah, so obviously one of the reasons we want to do this is just to enable kind of state of the art models to be incorporated into all of these different platforms. Um, specifically in the context of this talk, we're primarily going to be talking about frameworks like PyTorch. Um, this also applies though to things like CNTK, the, that's the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit if you're not familiar, uh, things like Chainer also. Um, basically all those smaller frameworks can all export to Onyx, which is, um, the, which we'll talk about what that actually stands for in a second. But, uh, but that's kind of the goal is to take these you know, state-of-the-art models that are coming out of major kind of research conferences and academic papers and actually move them to production and utilize them effectively. Um, we're only kind of addressing half of this thing here today. Part of this other part is obviously data and uh, annotating your data and quickly retraining the model. Uh, we're obviously just focusing mainly on production. That, that whole other, you know, getting data, utilizing transfer learning and meta learning, you could easily spend days or weeks on that. So we're just going to assume for these purposes that you already have the data and kind of retrain the model to fit what your specifications will be for production. Um, okay, and then, then so the major challenges are poor Python support uh, in Flink. Um, you know, the current only current API with Flink uh, is um, for Flink with Python is Jython, which doesn't work very well. Um, at all. It doesn't ha even have NumPy support. Um, um, so that's obviously a barrier. On vice versa, currently Onyx, it's very hard to um, incorporate it into Java. Uh, of course, converting the model from the framework itself is kind of an arduous and tedious task. And finally, you know, it can be challenging, particularly with some of these NLP frameworks, to get the exact same pre-processing as you'd see. Uh, in Python in Java. Okay, so uh, first let's talk about why why this is kind of important. So over time, um, PyTorch has been ga been gaining a lot of popularity, particularly um, particularly in the research community as kind of an alternative to TensorFlow. TensorFlow overall is still oh, is still prime altogether more popular, but increasingly we're seeing papers and frameworks being implemented inside PyTorch. Um, so here are just some quick stats. You can see PyTorch is also kind of gaining traction, but particularly in terms of research conferences, the International Conference on Learning Representations is a very big machine learning and kind of AI conference really focused on state-of-the-art models, and you see like a huge increase in PyTorch uh, papers that implemented um, their code in PyTorch. Um, also here are just examples of frameworks, particularly in PyTorch you have a ton of NLP frameworks that work very well. 
I'm actually currently working on implementing some um, text to SQL models in the Allen NLP framework. Um, you, you also have Flare, Parlay AI, Par, Parlay AI um, OpenNMT. Um, there are also some others like Pyro, which is the probabilistic programming framework built on PyTorch. Um, so there are just a ton of like increasing and emerging frameworks all in PyTorch. Okay, so uh, I've been saying uh, throwing Onyx around a lot. Uh, I'm going to find out exactly what it is. It basically stands for the Open Neural Network Exchange Format. It's basically this idea that if you, regardless of what you train the network in, that you can export it to, can serialize and export to this common format. So right now there are a number of different frameworks supported uh, for exporting. We'll get on to the actual running the exported model in a second, which is a whole other deal. But currently you can export models from, well, CAFE2, except that's one of the major things to run it, Chainer, CNTK, um, Badoos, Paddle Paddle, um, Mat, even MATLAB. Um, so if you have kind of a niche deep learning framework you like using, the cool thing about Onyx is you can just export models very easily to that format. So let's look at why we might want to use Onyx. Um, so there, so the goal of Onyx is to be able to, the end goal is to be able to run it in a variety of different languages, take all these neural networks um, trained on a variety of backends, export to a common format, then import them into essentially any language. That's the goal in Siri. Um, so that's the major advantage of it. Um, the, there's also a side effect. Generally, when you serialize them, the models themselves are a bit smaller. Um, but the major reason is that you could run it in a variety of different languages and, diff and take models from various frameworks and all run them exactly the same. OK, so overview of so this really applies not just to Onyx, as we'll see later. This could be anything in Python. But basically, you have three core ways you can integrate deep learning models at this point. Uh, probably the easiest and the ones people will be most familiar with would be just to create a microservice and then call it with Flink and async IO, kind of the way you'd call it a database or something. The second is Java embedded Python, which I'll talk about in detail in a bit. Um, and the third is to, and the ideal way would just to be to load the model natively into Java or Scala and run with one of these Onyx backend uh, JVM-based frameworks. So Onyx frameworks overview. So this is just a quick kind of a screenshot um, showing which Onyx frameworks, the kind of framework slash tool and then we see both an exporting, that means you can export the mo model from that framework, and an importing, that means you can run Onyx models on that framework. Um, some of this is a bit deceiving because even the ones that do say importing up here, they don't necessarily support all the operations you need to run the neural network. Um, and we'll look at that in more detail in a second, but this is just kind of an overview. So. Um, for most frameworks, exporting is now fully supported. It's just importing and running it. That's the problem. Oops. So Onyx scorecard, so to measure kind of what operations are supported in Onyx, um, they have this scorecard. Um, and it basically, there are a total of, they came out with the number, a uh, total of, I think, 160. 16 operations, I believe, that are necessary to do all the current tasks and kind of deep learning. Um, and this is just kind of a screenshot of the top part of the report, uh, the card. If you, I'll post my slides later, and if anyone wants to go to it, you can see the full kind of scorecard. Um, so these are kind of like, this is CAFE2, this is the TensorFlow backend. You can see these are some of the supported operations versus operations that are kind of still failing on both. Um, so let's look at, so yeah, so this is kind of rehashing. Let's look at options for Java now specifically. Uh, first, I just want to note the TensorFlow backend for Onyx is not the same as kind of TensorFlow. It still has special operations, so you can't just say run Onyx models on Java TensorFlow now. 
because this still has kind of Python specific. So uh, just so <laughs> that's clear. So um, immediately we can see Java is fairly limited. Um, the only one, CNTK is probably hopefully going to incorporate full support soon, but right now it's only experimental. We also have this other framework called Vespa that has some Java support and Meno that has Java support. But as we'll see in a second, those are kind of extremely limited. Um, so this is a Meno example in Java and, you, and um, Meno essentially has only 19 of the 116 neural network operations supported. Uh, so it can handle things like basic convolutional neural nets like SqueezeNet for the most part, um, which is a very simple CNN. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't really handle much else. I don't even think it can handle recurrent neural networks at this time. So it's uh, very limited, particularly for natural language processing uh, type problems. Um, but here's just a basic example of how you might try to import an Onyx model in Meno. Um, and you can see this process itself is kind of tedious because you need to visualize parts of the neural network and then expressly kind of add them to the output profile. So obviously, um, Meno is a candidate, I'd say, to be able to do this, but it's not there yet, particularly with both from this operation standpoint and this need to manually get kind of these different output profiles, which means you have to essentially visualize the Onyx model then input these manually. Um, I suppose you could write your own code to fill in some of those, but uh, really, that should be provided in Meno. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to when not to use Onyx. Um, so the export process in many cases from PyTorch or whatever framework can be difficult and time consuming. Um, backends, as we just saw, have limited support. Um, even the full-scale CAFE 2 version and the TensorFlow version uh, I think they support something like 109 operations. They still don't support all 116. So for instance, a popular object detention model, uh, object detection model uh, called you only look once um, still cannot run in CAFE 2 or the TensorFlow backend um, because there's no support of this image scaler operation. Um, and some models uh, need to, you need to entirely retrain. Um, uh, I won't go into that now, but particularly for some NLP models which incorporate kind of vocab into the, into the memory of the model, um, you need to retrain with the vocab outside the model. Um, so, um, but there, there is a link to that, an article, and it's a pretty lengthy article. Um, so, with that said, probably one of the easier ways to doing things is to do async and a microservice. Um, you probably all know more about this than me, but it's basically just like if you had a database set up using async, basically you call, you call it, it will handle things asynchronously. Um, some of the cons are just of this approach though is having to handle the sc scaling and maintaining a separate service. Um, but of course then you don't have to rewrite code, you basically just make a common REST API which is a bit easier. Um, so now we'll move on to Java Embedded Python, or JEP for short. Um, so with J Java Embedded Python, um, what happens is it actually calls the JNI, or the Java Native Interface, and that makes calls to the C Python API, or the Cython API, um, and basically can start this uh, Python process inside the Java virtual machine. It's pretty fast too. Um, I think someone did a talk at Flink a couple of years ago about using uh, JEP and they found it ran pretty, with Keras actually, and it ran pretty fast. Um, and of course, the, the, the good thing about JEP is once you work out kind of some of the problems with it um, in terms of shared libraries, you can use pretty much any package or Python library NumPy, NumPy, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, et cetera. Um, yeah, and it has, and it does support automatic conversion um, of Java primitives into Python, into the Python interpreter and back and forth. So that's kind of a nice 
useful feature too. Okay, so unfortunately with this, the problem is setup can still be a bit of a problem. So um, essentially this requires you getting all your Python dependencies on the same, um, con well, speaking from a container perspective, the same container you have Flink, and Flink needs to, the Flink program that runs needs to be able to find uh, the path to all your Python libraries. You can pass them as, a, as an environment variable, but in practice, there seems to always be some problem finding these all your Python dependencies. Uh, I don't know exactly why, since it shouldn't be, but you know, it's particularly when running in a cluster setting or even um, locally, there seems to always be some problem. Um, so yeah, obviously on EMR, you could have a bootstrap script install this, um, though, uh, so one of the things that I did recently is I kind of combined the f standard Flink Docker to include, I made my own Docker image, I expanded the Flink Docker image to include JEP and uh, your standard kind of Python packages, and this will alleviate some of the headache with that. Um, so it just makes things a bit easier. So if, with that, obviously, that setup, I'd obviously recommend running Kubernetes, um, because then you just have your Docker, you can just use that Docker container, which takes care of a lot of that headache. So now let's move on to uh, an actual example. So I know I showed Flare a while ago. So Flare is actually a really interesting and neat, uh, and neat kind of PyTorch framework. Basically, what Flare does is it uh, is it handles a variety of op operations. Um, for an NLP, so it has both you know sentiment models, models for sentiment and automatic sentiment recognition, named entity recognition. Actually, in named entity recognition, there is now an uh, implementation of the current state of the art. Um, so if you're, and I think and believe in both English and German um, are supported on Flare, the kind of state of the art named entity recognition models. Also, they're constantly incorporating new models and things. So for instance, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Bi uh, BERT, but recently Google came out with a big kind of, uh, kind of step forward in um, natural language processing models called BERT. I forget what the acronym actually stands for now, but it, it kind of moved forward and got the state of the art on a number of tasks. And within like two weeks, they'd added those kind of pre-trained weights to Flare. Um, so that so it's a very good framework for a variety of NLP models. So one of the questions, one of the things I wanted to do was integrate Flare automatically into my Flink streaming pipelines. So, so with the Onyx method, that is actually pretty difficult because Flare actually subclasses Flare, Flare subclasses PyTorch.nn, so the neural network module. So it has its own classes, and therefore it's very difficult to actually just directly export to Onyx. So, so this is kind of a good example of why of a case where you might not want to export to Onyx because it would take so much refactoring of the code to export the model and you probably still have to retrain it. So, so um, now I'm gonna show you a quick example um, of Flare, of using Flare with JEP. Um, so, um, I hope everyone can see that all right. It might be kind of small if you're in the back. But, um, but basically what this does is I'm just using, going to use JEP uh, with Flare in a rich map function. So this is kind of your standard kind of rich map function. Uh, in reality, I probably want to do this exactly this way. Here I'm returning stuff just as a string. Uh, in reality, I probably want to ha actually maybe do a hash map or something else so I'd have the names and the labels. But just for kind of simplicity state, state I'm going to return stuff as the whole kind of result from Flare as a string. Uh, and then we, then I have this tweet data class um, where basically I'm just doing 
I just kind of extended the basic Flink example of you know streaming Twitter data. So this is just with the Flink Twitter connector. Um, this code is also open source, and I'll show you the link at the end. Um, so let's look at what we're doing. So here's the open part of the function. And this is important because uh, if you don't put your model loading in the open, it will set in the open um, part of the function, it will load your it will load and reload the model every iteration, which will obviously be ridiculously slow because this is a huge model. So you really want the model loading to take place here so that um, you're not constantly loading and reloading the model. So, and this is the cool thing about JEP. So this is essentially just Python, but it's running in this kind of um, JEP shared interpreter. Um, and, and, this is, and basically, there are other ways of doing this as well. So you can actually have an external Python file and then load it um, in, this, in a similar manner. But here I'm just actually writing the Python out as strings here. Um, and so this will actually run and load the model. Um, you also have to catch exceptions. Uh, and oh yeah, one more thing. So I'm using a shared interpreter. JEP actually has a couple different interpreters. Um, I found the shared interpreter to be one of the easier ones because if you don't use the shared interpreter, you're likely to get all these kind of weird dumps in the case of an error because it might try to use a Python module that isn't shared. And then you have to manually add the paths of all the Python modules. Um, but definitely, in, uh, in production, you might move to just kind of the standard JEP interpreter and then carefully add the paths of all the Python models because this marks essentially everything with Python as shared. And uh, because of that, it's also hard to add paths to say like files uh, that you write um, just inside um, to load. So just keep that in mind. So um, that's the open function. Now let's look at the actual function that we might call to process it. Um, as I said, yeah, it doesn't really make too much sense to return stuff as a string, but just kind of <laughs> bear with me for this. Um, so here uh, we have this tweet data class. Um, and so yeah, I just get the tweet text. Uh, you do have to do some cleaning because I found if you like particularly pass really weird strings to Python, uh, the kind that you know wouldn't would be very unsanitized coming from like Twitter. It will like throw um, errors and JEP will fail. You could also probably do that pre processing in uh, Python if you wanted, um, though I just chose to do it in Java. Um, so, and this basically is an example of how you set a variable. So to actually set a variable in Python, you just do um, j dot set, which is called calling the JEP interpreter and setting text as that variable. Um, and then, yeah, but kind of what I was showing before, for evaluation statements, you just do the run eval. And then, then the result, you could do j.getValue, um, and that will get the value. Here, I'm just kind of being, as I said before, being lazy. I'm just getting the value and returning it to a string. In reality, you probably want to actually do more processing in Python, I'd say, and return it to maybe JSON or something. Probably JSON would be the easiest, and then you could just process that in Java um, and load that directly into a Java class using one of the standard libraries you use to convert JSON to a class. But um, this is just kind of a proof of concept example um, I used. And it, and it actually did run fine. I found that inference speed was pretty quick particularly uh, having moved model to the open. Obviously, if you included model here, it would be very slow. Okay, so here's another quick example of sentiment analysis. Um, this is the standard kind of Python code you, that you'd use with Flare for sentiment analysis. And it's gonna be very similar to what we saw before. Um, so um, yeah, basically almost the exact same Saying we kind of set the value, we do model.predict, and except here we do get the labels, um, and then we might return um, the result to um, a string here. Yeah, it would probably make sense to um, return it again to something else. 
but this is just kind of a simple example. Okay, so like now let's think about maybe if we wanted to put all this together. Um, I'm currently wor working on kind of an open source example that you can go to later um, if you're interested. So you might consume data from the Twitter source using the Flink Twitter connector. You might then filter out non-English tweets, uh, pretty standard. Um, as I said, Flare, there are some models that are multilingual and that can handle multiple languages. So you could, um, you might be able to load a, mu a multitask named entity recognition model. There are also models for specific languages. I think they have German, Polish, a couple others. And then you could obviously just um, run some map operations to uh, map them to the proper model. Um, next, you're going to do, next you could do named entity recognition on the tweets. Um, and then you would, and this is where the actual flare comes in, then sentiment analysis. Um, then you could convert this to a table, assuming you got some type of tuple at the end of this, and then, and then run a, qu a query like this where you would select the enemy's, uh, entity sentiment and the, count, and the count, and then group by entity, entity and sentiment. And the, and the cool thing about this is then you would essentially have kind of a real-time view of um, just, the, just the named entities in the Twitter text and the sentiment, um, positive and negative, a real-time sum of those. So that would be kind of fa fairly interesting to see. You could, of course, also combine this with like tumbling windows or some other attributes um, to get, you know, 10 second, 20 second, or whatever you want kind of views of this. But I think that's just kind of a good example of like the power, I guess, of incorporating deep learning uh, and those types of models into Flink is that you can um, do kind of cool things like that. Um, yeah, it looks like I'll actually be a little under time today, but um, I'll leave plenty of time for questions. So conclusions of this. Um, yeah, so currently the easiest way I'd say is still to use JEP or a microservice. That is just simpler that at this point, uh, I still hope there will be full-fledged Onyx support incorporated um, in one of these Java frameworks, whether that's Meno, whether that's CNTK, whether one of the other things rolls that out. I think that would simplify things. Um, but, but currently this paragram, as I showed, it saves the time of converting the model to Onyx. There's no need to rewrite your Python code. Um, and yeah, as I just said, in the future, maybe one of these Onyx, Onyx um, backends will actually work well with in Java. Um, but right now, they're just too immature and there's too few operations supported in them. Okay, questions? You said you'd want to provide the link to your GitHub. Oh, okay, it's right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Is there an official place to post slides with? Or, uh, yeah, maybe some of the other people. But yeah, I'll definitely post them and you can screenshot that mm -hmm. if you want. So you mentioned the uh, inference time was pretty good um, in terms of executing the model. Do you have any benchmarks or kind of data behind like, you know, what is the increase in latency? Yeah, I haven't done any like formal benchmarks yet. That's kind of my next step. All I, all I kind of observed was seemed to be fairly fast running on a cluster. Like, <laughs> I know that's not anything concrete, but generally it would run in, I was seeing a throughput, I think of like around 30 to 40 tweets per second. So that's just, so that's pretty good with deep learning miles. Obviously something better would be to do a real benchmark, but that's kind of the next step. Is this running on a CPU or a GPU or a hybrid implementation? 
Yeah, so currently this is just running on CPUs. Um, the way I tested it was just on CPUs. I think like it w GPUs could definitely speed things up even more, um, possibly. I haven't tested that though. But yeah, that might be something to try out in the future.